Uh, welcome to January's um, version of our Coaches and Professionals kind of podcast um, panel. Whatever you want to call it, we're bringing education to you and good conversations to you for coaches and professionals. So um, I'll start with, uh, or we'll start with introductions. So um, if you each want to introduce yourselves, uh, what you do, and why you're passionate about mental health and um, why in your, in your role that it matters. So um, Andrea, if you want to start. Sure. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Davis, a physical therapist. I'm currently in private practice. Uh, been an athlete from eight years old and till, till forever. Played high school sports and college sports. And after physical therapy school, I went on to coach high school softball and uh, division one softball for, in college for a few years. So uh, been an athlete, been a coach, and now I'm a healthcare professional and I treat all, uh, all sorts of things, but me mental health is very important to me. Uh, I've seen it as a coach, uh, went through some things myself as a player, and now as a physical therapist dealing with athletes overcoming injuries, it's uh, even more uh, prevalent. So very excited to be here and thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, Bethany, do you wanna go next? Yeah, uh, my name is Bethany Rooster. I'm currently the head men's and women's cross country and track and field coach at Edgewood College in Madison. Um, I'm actually also a licensed mental health professional. Um, and so one of the other duties I have at Edgewood is our, I'm kind of our student athlete um, mental health educator. Um, so like I sent out a monthly email to all of our student athletes um, and the topics vary um, throughout the year. Um, and I give them like resources and books to read and apps and um, usually just write like a little synopsis of um, a topic. I have this website called Beyond the Outcome, uh, and I post like five articles pretty much every week about student athlete, or actually athlete mental health. It's not even student athlete. Um, it's professional. It's youth. It's high school, college. Um, and so I've been posting them probably since 2016. That's awesome. I love that. We'll definitely uh, dive into that. Um, and then Amanda, do you want to go next? Hey everyone, my name is Amanda Ranny. I am a uh, mental health professional here in Jacksonville, Florida, and currently operate out of my private practice where I provide counseling services, sports psychology services. Um, my educational background, I have a bachelor's in exercise science and a master's in mental health counseling. Um, I have been coaching adolescent athletes for over 10 years, and I'm also a cross country and track and field coach. Um, and currently at a local high school here in Jacksonville, um, at that school as well, I'm part of a uh, leadership committee that um, is looking to start mental health awareness initiatives on campus for student athletes starting this spring and then looping into um, next fall. Uh, mental health is very important to me. It's always been important to me, I think, since um, overcoming my own personal battles as a teenager and in college. Um, and then professionally, I just really, really love helping other people better understand themselves um, psychologically and physiologically. So really happy to be here and it's really nice to meet everyone. I have a really good feeling about this panel. There's a lot of similar kind of experiences, but also just so many different perspectives. So I'm really excited about this. Um, so Amanda, we'll start off with you for the first to kick it off. Um, what are some typical warning signs of a mental health crisis or an issue um, regarding mental health with student athletes and kind of what are some visible ones versus some harder to find kind of ones? Yeah, yeah. So when I, when I think of, you know, visible versus invisible, we also have categories of physical and emotional and mental. Um, there's always going to be things that we can't see. But as coaches and professionals working with athletes, um, there are some things that we could notice and generally speaking, probably anything that is out of the ordinary for that athlete. Um, and that's just to emphasize the importance of getting to know each one of your athletes. Um, and if that's not something that you have the time or capacity to do, um, to be able to utilize your coaching staff or people around you. But some of those physical signs that you might be able to see um, if we're noticing these things. So extreme fatigue, not recovering from workouts, uh, sleep disturbances, any sort of physiological signs. So when I say that, things going on inside of your body. So pounding heart, excessive sweating, shaking, that's unrelated to conditioning. 
So again, something that's out of the ordinary there. Um, noticeable weight loss, weight gain, changes in eating habits. And then this one, I don't think it's talked about a lot, but body language. So that is a physical sign. So if your athletes are um, showing signs of shame, so repetitive head down, um, indicating low self-esteem, other things like they just look sluggish out there on the field or in practice or in competition. Um, if their competition performance does not match their abilities in practice. So, you know, there's some sort of inconsistency there sometimes is a physical sign that something could be going on. And then persistent or overuse injuries. So in the distance running community, we see that a lot with shin splints, stress fractures, which could indicate a larger problem. So for example, if they're experiencing some sort of physical injury, um, what could be the underlying cause of that? Is it just a preseason, we're getting back into shape sort of thing, or is it not getting enough rest, not getting enough nutrition, reco not recovering properly, or cumulative emotional exhaustion that is then manifesting physically? Um, perhaps some of the visible mental emotional signs you might see, uh, social withdrawal, if they're normally in a particular group with their teammates and that changes, um, repetitive sport specific glitches or mental blocks. Mental block is something that some athletes will use to describe just something happening out there and they can't really, they can't really pinpoint what it is. Um, sudden decrease in confidence, loss of motivation, loss of interest or drive in their sport. Like they're just not really wanting to be there anymore. Um, related to that, if they're constantly skipping practices, not showing up, um, and that's not something that they've spoken to you about previously, um, or if their attitude is just overall changed, even if, even if they win, right? Even if there's a victory, they just have this very nonchalant sort of, you know, not caring one way or the other. Um, so I would say those are a lot of like physical things that we can see. And they're, they're things that would be visible. Um, things that are, we can't really see are things that they would have to report to us. So excessive worry or fear, anxiety, depressive symptoms, moodiness, irritability, difficulty concentrating. Maybe they're having difficulty in the classroom and that's not showing up in their sport. You might not be able to see that. Um, of course, any sort of suicidality, suicidal thoughts, um, or outside factors that may be impacting their sport. So relationship conflict, family conflict, uh, school, or other pressures. So I would say those would be invisible. I love the point you made about um, kind of looking at what's ordinary for the athlete and what's out of the ordinary for the athlete. So when you touched on um, like body language, that's knowing your athlete. When you touched on the more attitudes kind of things and the mental and emotional, that's knowing your athlete. So at the base of all of this to care for your athlete at, at your best, you need to know that athlete and build that relationship first. Um, so Bethany and Andrea, from your experiences as athletic trainers, coaches, um, and professionals, are any of these kind of warning signs that Amanda touched on more common? Do you see them more? Um, and how have you navigated the ones that are kind of tougher to see? Um, Bethany, do you want to start us off? Oh, well, yeah, sure. I mean, I think <clears throat> also like the time of the year, right? Like if I have anxious students and it's like before midterms, like I have to navigate like, okay, is this just like you have been sleeping because you've been studying a lot and like you're just withdrawing because um, you're just tired, um, you know? So I think the big one for me would be withdrawing from like groups of people like hanging out from like similar people that they typically hang out with or like want to do workouts on their own or like, you know, those types of things certainly um sleep is like huge man I if like students would just sleep consistently day in and day out like there would just um be a lot of differences I think um I try to go through one of the things I go through with our students um we call the smart smart routine so sleep meals activity level uh relaxation and triggers and so you know we talk about those and so if a student comes in and you know, is feeling stressed or overwhelmed, we kind of like go through those initially and see, okay, where are you at? Like, how are you doing? Oh, look, you haven't been eating enough or you haven't been sleeping enough or 
you know, you haven't taken time for yourself. And so maybe you need to take some time for yourself. Um, or, you know, these triggers, um, I always use the example of like, you know, you've gotten a fight with your parents maybe the night before in a phone call and like you have a race the next day, like probably not a great idea to talk to your parent at like 8 a.m. in the morning on the bus to the meet, you know, maybe talk to your parent after the meet so you can focus on what you need to focus on. Um, but with regards to other warning signs, I mean, I think that honestly, um, Amanda just listed a whole bunch that were really great. And I think you just need to know your athletes. Um, I try to meet with my student athletes uh, once every three weeks. Um, and it's really just a 15 minute check-in. Um, and I don't get, you know, everything I want in 15 minutes, but I do get a good, in, good information. Um, and then obviously check in with their event coaches. Um, they know a lot more, they see them a lot more regularly. Um, and so that's really helpful too. I love what you said about the SMART kind of acronym. I may steal that. Um, and <laughs> like sleep oh my gosh when you mentioned sleep and like the amount of conversations I've had with athletes as a coach on getting proper sleep and how to like have the tools to get that sleep and and all that stuff it's just so important and I think they don't realize how much it impacts them like you were saying um Andrea are there any other kind of warning signs that you see from your practice no I mean I think we touched on a fa fair amount of them for sure you guys are very uh thorough <laughs> in the list and I think the the common base really leaving on, even on like my side in, in the rehab, having been a coach and, and now rehabbing a ton of athletes. That's all I see is really just knowing knowing the kids, like knowing your athletes, knowing kind of what their baseline personality is, and, and any straying from that really um, are typically the the first uh, signs. And as coaches, especially, you know, especially college coaches, you're with them all. The, all the time, really. I mean, you eat, sleep, breathe, literally uh, uh, together, <laughs> study time and all. So um, I think knowing the athletes and, and gaining that uh, relationship, and even if it's not the head coach, as long as somebody on the coaching staff, I think that's what, what a lot of the, you know, I've learned at least on this side of things with the athletes, as long as they're connected to somebody on that adult, more adult coaching team, um, it's definitely gonna create a more secure environment so that there if, is a problem. Uh, hopefully they feel comfortable enough to reach out and that makes life so much easier. <laughs> I'm sure we would all agree on that. <laughs> and I think that's really important um, having somebody on staff and it doesn't, you know, like all 23 of your athletes on one roster aren't going to come to the same coach for everything because personalities don't always click as well as others do. Um, and I think that's something I've started learning as a coach is, okay, well, they're not all going to come to me and talk to me. If they come to another assistant on staff, that's great that's their person and that's fine. Um, so kind of moving into kind of more immediate um, warning signs and more kind of severe um, warning signs, I guess. Um, Andrea, I'll start with you on this one. Um, so warning signs in terms of immediate intervention and you need to talk to them now and get them help now versus having a conversation with them versus just kind of keeping an eye on them. So what, what are your warning signs that are like, oh my gosh, they need help now versus all right, let's keep an eye and see where you're at with this. I mean, I think it's uh, it's the extreme shift in, in personality, right? So extreme with, withdrawing uh, from the team or an extreme shift from uh, performance, so to speak, where, you know, if you have your top performer or somebody that's usually hyping, hyping the rest of the group up and they're just dropping off and being quiet and allowing someone else to, to step in, I think that's a, that's a huge indicator that, you know, something significant has shifted. Uh, like I stated previously, uh, I think the easy one is, you know, and, and this is kind of a, a little bit more my, my area now is when they come right out directly to you and uh, my, my most concerning ones are, hey, do you have a minute? And you're just like, uh-huh like I never don't have a minute and I'm sure as you know coaches we all know right the busyness is like yeah, yeah I'll talk to you but um for these kids some of these kids I think it's important for us to remember that it may have taken them weeks or, or possibly even months to get to the point to be like to even say hey do you have a minute and if you're dismissive of that and be like yeah, yeah, yeah we'll talk later and then you don't circle back around to that that um they may never say anything again so they have may may have given themselves a pep talk to get to that point so we we really um you know as a coach it got me into trouble when I was younger I coached when I was in my 
probably early 20s, like 20, 24 to 30. And um, I always had a minute right then. And then it kind of led to the other side, which was a little bit of taking on a lot of things. So I think it's important, comes back down with, with my experience anyway, to circle back around to uh, knowing your athletes, knowing when, it, when it's urgent and, and just kind of shutting down and making time for them. And I, I think that first step is when they say, do you have a minute? Yes, I do not right in this second, but before we leave, you and I are gonna have a conversation type thing. So just making sure that we're acknowledging when they come out. So, uh, cause it can be the gamut and what's uh, scary to them may not always seem scary to us. So I think there's, um, you know, some validity in uh, being able to sit down and let them explain themselves and, and lend a little bit of support. And I think another side of that that's important too, as a coach is we can't always have a minute right then because that's going to take a toll on our own mental health too. So knowing, like you were saying, knowing the severity and knowing when you can kind of sit down to have that conversation, if it's something that needs to happen at the end of practice, if it can happen the next day. Um, so then you can kind of manage your own emotional toll as a coach and ha manage those conversations too, I think is important. Um, so Bethany, depending on the severity of the warning sign, how would you intervene as a coach? Um, obviously it depends on the situation. Uh, we have a thing called EC cares at Edgewood. So, um, it allows us to anonymously report a student and our concerns. So sometimes I do that, but sometimes I ask actually, um, uh, a teammate or like if they're a teammate and a roommate, or if they're, a, um, a teammate that has concerns and they're seeing this stuff and I'm not seeing it, then I do ask the student like, hey, one of the things you can do is fill out AC Care, it's anonymous. It communicates to our Dean of Students and um, our, our, academic, our academic Dean, our Dean of Students, uh, all the necessary people, our mental health professionals, um, that there's a concern, someone, would follow, some, someone follows up with that person. Um, if it's on our team, honestly, some of your best, in my, op my opinion, some of the best knowledge I get is from teammates. Like teammates know everything about their teammates. Like they know like, the good, the bad, the not so great, the I'm really concerned about this person. Um, and that's good and valuable information. You know, as a coach, I try not to abuse that because I know they want to keep their like private, personal, confidential conversations with their teammates. Um, but we do have that conversation um, about, you know, if you really are, if you're concerned about one of your teammates, you need to say something either to me, to them, um, so that we can get that person the help that they need. Um, I'm not opposed, I've called 911 before if necessary. Um, you know, if that's the case and that's a scenario and a student's suicidal right there, um, those are okay things to do. That's what you have to do. You have to be willing to make those hard calls. Um, one of the things um, I do this mental health camp um, and one of the, it's for high school students. And one of the things I ask um, is the scenario is you have a teammate, your teammate says to you, I'm suicidal, but if you tell anyone, I'm going to follow through with it. What do you do? And that's so hard for high school students, even for college students, but it's so hard for high school students because they are peer, so peer driven, right? And so we talk about like, no matter what you say something, it doesn't matter. Like if you never have that relationship again, you may have saved a life. So as tough as it is to say something, you always have to say something. I love what you said about the peer driven part of it. And I think you're completely correct in the, the impact that teammates can have on being a part of that conversation and being a part of helping their own teammates and, and helping each other out. Um, so Amanda, kind of moving onto another level of that, if you, you know, you have a warning sign that you see in practice on a game day, um, come, an athlete comes into your office, how would you handle the situation differently if they're with other teammates or if you're in a practice setting around the entire team versus in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting? Well, first of all, I would kind of reiterate what Andrea was saying on um, acknowledging the courage that it took for them to come to you. So having that, that openness with them, um, whether that's, thank you for coming to me. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad that you are telling me about this. Um, so honoring their bravery and their vulnerability in that. And um, I think there is a level of confidentiality with this too. So, you know, if we're talking about um, an athlete comes to you individually versus in front of the team or with teammates and things like that, um, 
if they are okay with a teammate knowing about things or they came with a friend, for example, then that would be them giving that consent that someone else would could know about this too. Um, and But as far as severity and how that is handled differently, you know, if it is a severe suicidal case, for example, kind of like Bethany was saying, um, that would warrant attention. I think it's really um, a topic that a lot of people are scared to talk about and scared to address and bring up um, and might be hesitant to do so, but it's important to be direct in those situations. Um, if a student is expressing some sort of suicidal um, thoughts and know the hotline, um, there's a new hotline 988 that's out there now, um, but to not leave them alone if it seems like this is an active thing. Um, but as far as uh, some other things that could be um, handled, you know, immediately, um, things that I would consider drastic or odd. So that kind of goes with knowing your athlete. Um, those things probably warrant immediate, immediate attention as well. Um, that something could be going on maybe just kind of in the, in the short term that could be more severe. Um, and then anything that's like a physical injury, obviously we want to kind of keep that early. Um, but as far as, you know, being around peers and that sort of thing, I think it is important to um, have that team culture where you are going to care about your teammates first and their safety first. And if that sacrifices the friendship, um, it's, it's worth saving their life and it's worth um, putting their mental health first. And I think that's a very important message as well. Agreed. And then I guess kind of the other part of that, that question or scenario too is, um, like say I'm in practice with my entire team as a coach and I see an athlete who is showing these kind of more severe warning signs and I need to intervene right then, right now. How do you approach that athlete in a team setting and mm -hmm. get them in a comfortable position to be vulnerable? Got it. Yeah, that would probably be, um, you know, a side conversation. So um, after practice and approaching them with care and concern, I've noticed this. Um, have, have you noticed that too? I'm kind of giving them the autonomy to open up and um, be, but I wouldn't do it like out in the middle of the field. I wouldn't, you know, stop a play and go out there and have a conversation with them because they're probably not going to open up in that sort of a public situation. Um, but if it is on a team um, and you notice it out there during practice, for example, um, I would make an effort to follow up with the teammates not really around because they might not want to open up in front of their peers. There's a lot of stigma around mental health. Um, there's a lot of stigma around seeking help in general. So I think that as private as that conversation can be um, within public eye view, if you still need to be out in the open with a student, um, give a, an, a coach the assignment to go follow up with them maybe, or um, to handle the team while you approach with, with again, care and concern. Yeah, I would also, um, when you talk with a student regarding mental health, um, really be aware of how you present yourself, meaning how you sit, where you sit, right? If the door is closed and I sit in front of the door and the student's facing me, there's like no way out for them. Like it feels like, like they are enclosed and they're being attacked. So really think about where you're doing that one-on-one -on -one conversation and how you go about it. So you may have to think through it a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes you may want to bring a captain in. It depends on the relationship there. Um, you know, sometimes you may just want to bring one of the counselors on campus. Um, Cause if you don't feel totally comfortable all the time, that's okay. You know, like coaches aren't, they're not trained in mental health. I mean, most coaches are not trained in that. And um, I think there's a little bit more training out there, but it's still it's very different between like being a professional in it and being a coach. Um, and so being aware of those little things, they actually do matter. I, um, yeah, I mean, I a hundred percent agree, especially so 20 years later from, from my early twenties, uh, coaching experience on a collegiate level where I'm only a few years older than some of the kids that I'm coaching, right? I mean, Mayor, that's probably where you're sitting right now too. So there's definitely an approachability, I think, that, that I had that was different from the others that I was coaching with that were much my senior. 
And uh, that made me a little bit vulnerable as a coach where you're an authority figure, but yet you don't, I haven't really had a ton of experience, or at least I hadn't at the time. I had had my physical therapy training experience, which was helpful, but very, very different from me mental health training. So uh, I found myself in a couple of situations in those early coaching years where I was just like, <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing. And then uh, exactly like you said, that presentation of don't tell anybody and you're sitting there, you're like, okay, so I'm an adult, I'm in, I'm in this situation. And as a coach, I, I had a reportability, which, which I did and I followed the chain and compliance and all of those things, but it resulted in uh, some very strained uh, relationships that were difficult for my you know, younger self really to kind of manage with players that you care about. So uh, it definitely is a challenging situation, but I think the, the go-to is your responsibility is to the athlete as a whole and, and to make sure that, you know, you have appropriate support so that they have appropriate support. And, you know, worst case scenario, like you said, you don't really talk about it, right? So it's uh, difficult to talk about, but it, God forbid something happened. You, you, it's like everything else, like you tell the, the teammates, you'd never forgive yourself if you knew and you never, never said anything. So um, definitely think it's a uh, you know, important, especially as new coaches, hopefully there's, there's more training like this or accessibility to information that makes it a little bit easier to, to manage for sure. So I just want to comment on that. <laughs> and both of you touching on um, kind of, you know, the mental health trainings and um, having relationships with your wellness center. I think it's next month that we're actually going to talk about um, how to build relationships with your wellness center and your counseling center mm -hmm. as an athletics department. Um, and I think that's something that's so important because, you know, as smaller colleges or unless you're, unless you have the resources, you're not going to have a sports psychologist or a mental health professional in your athletics department. Um, and a lot of the times I think athletes can see that or student athletes can see that as um, it's going to be really hard to get into the counseling center and we're going to have to wait, you know, three weeks or whatever it may be on your campus. Um, and that can be a barrier. So I think building those relationships and having those conversations and having that training to be the first person and the first response and have a good impact in that first response is really important. And so I love that you guys touched on that. Um, so Andrea, I'll start with you. Um, we talked kind of about, you know, the warning signs and everything. Um, in an ideal world, we'd love to catch things before warning signs get severe. So what are some ways that you keep tabs on your athletes and check in with them before seeing that something is is wrong so i mean in my world sport, sports rehab and recovery um just recognizing as a uh, you know physical therapist with, with these kids recognizing that they're already uh at a little bit of a, in a vulnerable situation with uh being separated from their team some of them are not being able to perform to the best of their ability so um you know i think the the weekly check-ins go go a long way so one getting to know your athletes and then having uh, manageable check-in times where it's not, you know, you're sitting down with each player 30 minutes at a time and let's talk about our feelings, but you know, Hey, how you doing this week? Like anything, anything going on? What's your test schedule? Like, you know, how's home life, just, you know, keeping it light and casual because as, as you continue on it, you're actually building that relationship um, over time, which I think makes it easier to one, you'll be, you'll be able to pick up things a little bit easier um, and two, they'll be comfortable enough that um, you hope, right, that they're going to kind of speak up before it's like, ah, eh, you know what, this week's not so great. All right, well, you know, if there's anything you want to talk about, give me, a, give me a heads up and, and we'll make some time, you know, and then you check in the next week. Hey, last week wasn't so great, any better this week type thing. So um, that's, that's what I think. And that's what we do as a, as a practice for sure. And that's all the way through. Um, and it, it has helped us kind of flag things uh, ahead of time and, uh, you know, parental acknowledgement and whatnot, whoever we need to get involved, athletic trainer, parent, coach, you know, whatever with the, uh, the athlete's consent type thing. So I love that you said keeping it light and casual in that conversation, because I think so many times student athletes or coaches even can think that it's such a big topic to talk about. And it's, you know, that stigma is so large. How do we tackle this? where if you just have a conversation and talk about it and it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be a half an hour long. It, it can be one sentence, one check-in um, that can have impact and can build that relationship. Like you were saying. Um, yeah. And I think even like something as simple as like, you know, how you doing? Oh, I'm tired today. How you doing next time? Oh, I'm tired today. 
well, last like two weeks I've seen you're tired every day. What's going on? Are you sleeping? Are you eating? Like what's going on? You're hydrating. Um, you know, so little stuff like that sometimes feel may feel insignificant, but taking in, in a bigger context, I think it really does help. A hundred percent. Um, Bethany, is there anything that you do, um, from a coaching perspective, um, in terms of like check-ins, any systems that you have, um, that you would recommend to kind of other coaches? Um, like I said, I try to meet with all our student athletes every like three weeks or so. And like, you know, I've, I've done a little bit more broader stuff in the past, but now just giving some, some feedback from students, right? Sometimes they're like, well, I don't want to talk about these personal things. And it's not like I ask them personal things. They just start like, you know, spilling. And so I kind of, you know, I start talking about um, specifically like their most recent race, how it went, how their training's going, how school's going. We talk about those things. And I always add, add at the end, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? And so it opens the door for them, but like, I'm not like fishing for anything specific. Um, and it's really just to give them the opportunity. So they can say something, they don't have to say something. Some are just like ready to leave and that's okay. Um, but to give them that opportunity is better than not saying, you know, better than to not give them that opportunity at all. You know, cause they may not say anything for the first like three times. And then second semester freshman year, they're like, oh, I, I needed to tell you this and I never did. Okay. But like keeping that door open um, and always having that option, is there anything else you'd like to share can be really helpful. And I like the, the kind of keeping the door open and not, like you were saying, not fishing. Um, that kind of brings me to my next question. So Amanda, um, what are some ways that you can balance making sure an athlete's okay, like Bethany was kind of saying, and not being overbearing. So keeping the door open um, and making sure that you're having a conversation, but not being overbearing in that conversation and having too much um, to do, I guess, in that. Yeah. So um, what I'm hearing a lot of is like, we really care for our athletes. Um, we might not have training in mental health and how to handle that. And I experienced that too. So I was coaching before I became a mental health professional. And so then you, you have that almost compassion fatigue. Sometimes, you know, you really want to help all of them. You're not really sure where the resources are or where to send them and things. So I think as coaches, as it is important to know what, what is the protocol when a student comes to you? What are the, what are resources available to you and to the athlete on campus? Um, what are some outside resources available? Um, but I think what can also be helpful in that is uh, to show them that you care about them without using language like you are keeping tabs on them because you know, they're, they want autonomy, they want independence, um, they want to show, they want to know that you care and so structure is important, I think they're going to expect that from you as an authority figure, um, but to show that you always have their best interest in mind. Uh, whether that is directly telling them that, whether that's like a some sort of weekly check-in like we've been talking about, um, but being an advocate for mental health yourself, uh, speaking highly of mental health professionals so that they know, hey, my coach supports this. They know this person on campus. They've experienced things like this before, you know, however, however you want to normalize it in your own way. Um, I think another approach that can be helpful is a proactive one. So I think um, Bethany was talking a little bit about this earlier too, and educating about holistic self-care. So we implemented this with our cross country girls this past year and really teaching, what is it like to, to take care of our bodies mentally, physically, emotionally? Um, how do we know when we, we need a, a break? How do we know when our body is experiencing this? Um, and with that kind of comes, I think, normalizing off days. So it's okay to have an off day. We're human beings. We all have off days. But when is too many off days maybe a cause for concern, you know? So if you're working with athletes who are in middle school, for example, they're still gaining that body awareness. They're still gaining that self-awareness. And I think as a coach, sometimes it can be helpful to, to teach them those things because then they might notice before you do. And then they can come in to you with that open door. Um, but so definitely being proactive, definitely being an advocate. Um, and then just really giving that message that you care about them as a person, 
regardless of caring about them as an athlete, um, regardless of performance, you know, just really kind of building that relationship so you can have that open door with them um, to where if you are instilling these sorts of tabs or check-ins or whatever they are, that it feels like it's for their benefit and it's not just that you're being a helicopter coach or you are um, in implementing rules for no specific purpose. I think if they know the purpose, they know that it's out of genuine care and they know that it can positively impact their performance as well. Taking care of your mental health can definitely do that. I think they can see it as a competitive advantage, which they will be more likely to participate in. I have to add to Amanda. Um, I think the idea, you know, years ago I used this phrase, and it was my, and I have to say this consistently to, especially a lot of my female athletes, um, my care and concern, my care and concern for you as a person is not based on your performance. But then I had to live it day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and day out. And guess what? Then I had to apologize because sometimes I didn't live it. And I had to say, hey, I was wrong. Hey, I'm sorry. Because that makes me real. That makes me just like them, right? Like I'm, I am obviously like oversee them, but like, I, you know, I still struggle. I still have challenges too. I'm not going to get it right all the time. And no coach is going to get mental health right all the time. And that's okay. But like, you got to own it when you're wrong as a coach and your athletes will respect you a lot more if you own it when you're wrong. And if you got it wrong, um, I think the other thing, you know, in my personal experience at Edgewood and like my role and my knowledge is. Um, finding that balance for me, a lot of my recruits actually, and my current students sometimes ask like, hey, coach, where is your balance between you being a licensed mental health professional and you being a coach? And I said, well, there are some very just common things that happen, you know, when freshmen come in, they're like, they're homesick, or there's like transitions. And so like, if a student comes in, and we're talking about something like once or twice, that's pretty normal. If a student comes in, and we've, we've talked more than like, three times, I'm sending in the counseling services because my job at Edgewood is athletic coach and mental health educator. Outside of that, that's my role is not to be a therapist here. And I know that. And then I refer them to the necessary resources either on this campus or off this campus. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I think uh, like uh, personalizing it, like if you can and you feel comfortable with it, um, it goes a long way with these these kids. And I think um, especially the the girls for sure, because you know a lot of them uh, in athletes, you know, you have to be tough, you're uber competitive, and especially if you're in the collegiate level and you know you're recruiting, and then you you get recruited and you, you got to beat out these other kids that are you know so like you all come into college as really good athletes, and a lot of these high school kids don't always realize. Uh, that transition from high school sports and the collegiate sports where you were maybe the stud and now you're like one of like seven studs or you know whatever it is but um, I know once I got comfortable with with myself I guess which comes with age and experience but you get comfortable with yourself and uh, would share with these some of these girls they're like wait you have off days too I'm like oh girl please I'm like I have off days like more than I have on days sometimes so um, and then how you manage it, where you know you take a step back and make sure you're checking your sleep, your nutrition, your hydration, all of that stuff. I mean, those are life lessons that like the more I think we normalize that, um, the easier it is to have that dialogue. So I think it was a great, great point, ladies. So thank you for bringing that up for sure. <laughs> and I agree, obviously, 100% with what you're all saying. Um, I'm just thinking about myself as a coach and um, I love that you said like being an open mental health advocate, because I think, um, I think Amanda, you were kind of touching on, um, if you're open about that advocacy and you have that conversation and you're walking the walk and talking the talk, then they will come to you to have that conversation. You won't have to, I don't want to say you won't have to look out for warning signs, but they'll feel, they'll feel much more open coming to you than kind of sitting on it and having to have that internal, should I go to coach? Should I not go to coach? Will coach respect me? Will coach have my back? Um, kind of thing there. And I love that you were talking about um, educating about self-care and giving them the tools um, and knowing your lane. I think that's something that, um, you know, I've talked to a bunch of other coaches and some of them have said to me, sometimes it feels like we have to be therapists. And um, Bethany, like you were saying, knowing your lane and knowing when to um, refer them to professionals and refer them to counseling services, not only for their, their mental health, but for yours too. Um, so the next thing to kind of dive into, um, 
what are some tips that you would give to coaches to help their student athletes with their mental health? So um, the first kind of one that I think of is mindfulness. So um, I'm an assistant coach at the collegiate level and my head coach is huge on mindfulness and meditation and breath work. So, and she always says to everybody, um, we're going to do this like at the end of practice. And um, it's something that you can use when you get in the box and you're, you have a three, two count and you're really stressed out and you have to hit this run in or whatever the situation is, your breath is something that grounds you and keeps you constant and, you know, is something that can impact you outside of the field as well. So um, I'll start with you, Bethany. Is there anything that you kind of integrate with your athletes um, that impacts them on the field and off the field in terms of um, like tips and tricks that you use with them? Yeah, I mean, I kind of just will go through, I mean, our coaches do a whole bunch of different things. So like we, you know, some coaches do um, Mindfulness Monday, right? And so um, breathing, um, mindfulness exercises, et cetera. I'm going to just do wellness Wednesday, you know, just like those popular terms and they pick something specific that they talk about, like some sort of topic. Um, we do grateful Friday. And so just reminding students, you know, what are you grateful for? Cause like you might've had a rough week, but at the end of the day, like, you know, there are some things, there are always things to be grateful for. Like you have a really good life for the most part. I mean, um, and so like identifying what those things are that you're grateful for, even if it seems like really small at the moment. Um, so those are some other types of things. Um, let's see, other tips. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about um, uh, emotional intelligence and what that means. And that's not just like a, you know, a one-time pop. It's a, it's a long-term thing. Um, this year we're doing, on my team, we're doing th uh, Thoughts for Thursday. So all of our coaches, we picked like 16 different topics and all of our coaches are um, talking about them. And, you know, some are track related and cross country related or specific like running. So we'll talk about like the history of sport. Some are like um, mental health components, uh, emotional intelligence is one. We'll talk about um, mental health wants versus needs. Um, we'll talk about, um, finances, you know, so like just all these things that potentially um, are very relevant to students this day and age and what's happening. I, mean, I think our coaching staff has such a breadth of knowledge <laughs> and different ages and phases and experiences. And so what else can we share with them outside of like sport? Because um, sport's great. But at the end of the day, our student athletes at Division Three, where we're at, they're not going to be professional athletes. And so we want to provide them with like all these other possible opportunities um, that that they can know more about. Um, so we send these emails out and like some kids respond, some kids don't. We don't, we don't know if students read them or not, but they're really there for them just to gain some more knowledge. I love the idea of that um, and kind of the emotional intelligence aspect of it that you touched on is super important, I think. Um, Amanda, is there anything that you do with your athletes or um, that you kind of lean more towards? Yeah, um, I'm definitely going to piggyback off of the emotions, um, normalizing emotions. We need emotions for our drive and our passion for our sport. I think um, being able to, to teach how do we harness those emotions um, in competition, outside of competition, I think is a big one. Um, and we did a lot of the workshop Wednesdays is kind of what we did. So we had a uh, mental strategy workshop is what we called it. Um, and that was throughout the season where we would teach some of these things. Um, they were mental skills that could be applied to the sport, which let's face it can really be applied to life in general. Um, so really being able to use that educational tool there. Um, also encouraged journals. So this was something that they could share with coaches, um, really just keeping tabs on how are you recovering from workouts? How are you feeling about this? Um, really like, how did this go for you? So going back to your uh, toolkit analogy of giving them tools that they can help to um, better understand themselves, what's going on, what are some internal and external factors that could be impacting performance? Um, so they have that data that they can share with, share with us if they want to. Um, sometimes technology can kind of help there too. So I don't know how this could be applicable for other sports that aren't distance running, but for specifically for distance running, um, if you have any sort of, um, 
watches that track your sleep or um, track your stress level, your heart rate, your you know heart rate reserve, all these special terms. Um, sometimes you can have access to that as coaches through a dashboard. So you can actually see you know, how much sleep did my athletes get this night? And should I approach them about this? And so we're usually open with our athletes. Um, I see you didn't really get a lot of sleep last, last night. What's going on there? And showing out of care that um, this is going to make them more effective um, at school and in their sport and just as overall well-being. So, um, so I guess digital journals, journaling is what you could call that. Um, physical journals that could be private or that could be shared. Um, and then another thing, because we don't all have mental health training as coaches, um, not all coaching staff has a mental health professional there. So I would encourage um, asking the athletic director for bringing in guest speakers, uh, whether or not that be inspirational, um, former athletes to come in and share their stories or uh, mental health professionals to come in and speak to the athletes or to speak to the coaches, um, just to con continue the conversation, um, to be able to have that open door policy. But then that also can give the athletes another voice that they're hearing that isn't just yours. Um, so that then when you do echo or if they echo you, there's consistency in the language. I think that's super important. And sometimes, you know, if it is a professional athlete, they can revere that professional athlete more than they may revere their coach and they may be more receptive to that. Um, in terms of the journaling, curious question. Um, when would you have them journal? When do you think is best? Do you think right after practice when the emotions are high or do you think they need to sit on it for a couple hours until they're kind of more, more neutral with their emotions? I think that's just a very individual preference probably. Um, we don't have journals right after practice and tell them to go write down or anything like this. It's actually a strategy that was implemented in the preseason. So preseason camp um, was just trying to kind of teach the skill of noticing what's going on in your body. What, what are the thoughts and emotions that you're experiencing? So whether or not the girls continued it throughout the season, we're not really sure. I mean, that's kind of up to them. So it was more of a, um, an option that they could choose to do and, um, really implement that before the season started. So um, personally, if it were me, I journal every night before I go to bed because then it's like you kind of get everything out from the day um, and you have some time to have either process the emotions or not. Um, typically not so much and that's why you do it before you go to bed or that's why you do it um, with a little time in between. So you can kind of, um, you know, filter out anything that needs to be filtered. Andrew, do you add anything else um, in terms of tips and tools and tricks that you use? Yeah, I mean, uh, visualization is a, a big one for us, uh, for sure. And um, I think, you know, along with um, Bethany and Amanda, like adding, naming, like what you're feeling, I think it's like, a, it feels like a super basic function, but uh, I've realized, you know, just in talking uh, more and more, we've just recently incorporated um, so it's a orthopedic and sports physical therapy practice, but we've started incorporating uh, sports psychology and mental health into the practice because of the amount of strain that, that we witness on a regular basis with, with, you know, a lot of our athletes. And it's not even just the, the major ones like ACL reconstruction where they're, they're out of their sport for almost a year. It's even like simple things like ankle sprains and whatnot, just the, um, whether it's, we know more, so we see more these days or after effects of COVID and just the generation that's coming up. But uh, I think a lot, a lot of people, generally speaking, really struggle with naming what they're feeling and why they're, you know, why they're feeling it. So frustration as opposed to anger, as opposed to disappointment and, you know, where is that coming from? So, so that's a big one we talk about and that's with everybody, not just the, the athletes, you know, what are you feeling? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well, let's, you know, you might want to think about that and then we can come back around to it. And then um, if we're frustrated, what are you frustrated about? Is it that, you know, you did eight out of your nine activities uh, perfectly well, but this one thing you can't nail down. So let, let's try and kind of work on that. 
Um, and then just reinforcing the positivity with that. So um, we have a tendency in competitive. I mean, I'm uber competitive, as, as you know, Mayor. And um, we have a tendency, I think, to focus on what we can't do and trying to uh, wrap that around with, okay, you can't do that now, but, you know, let's put steps in place to, you know, get to the point that you can execute it. And visualization, I think, goes hand in hand with that, so. These are all, all of these are like, oh, hold on, Bethany, go ahead. I think one of the other things that um, I think is really critical is to discuss failure. Talk about it. You know, one of the things we talk about, I make all my staff typically sometimes, um, or my captains, like we write our failures on the board so that like people can see them and it humanizes us as, as you know, leaders or role models, mentors for our student athletes. Like, when did you fail? And what did you learn from it, right? Most of us, you know, we, we all have failed for so many years, right? But like your young childhood failures, like learning to walk, like you, you just keep doing it, right? You just keep, you just do it because you want to do better at some point, And like, you know, I haven't quite figured out when or where, or why we like do not embrace failure. We cannot fail or like, we just like, we won't even go there right? We won't try a new sport. We won't try a new, you know, subject to study. We won't try a new class. Like if we didn't like art, we're like, oh, I'm not going to take that. And it's like, instead of that mindset, learning how to embrace failure and make it part of your training routine, you know, being okay with like, all right, I want you this race, we're going to go all out, you know, for the first 800 meters. And heck, you might like, just die the last 800, but we're going to learn how to do something different. You know, like, obviously that's not all the time and not the important races, but too often, I think we have students that come into college and they like, don't want to fail. And that's like really scary for them. But I think once they start to fail and they fail well, they're okay with it a little bit more. And that would be my hope because none of us have gone through life without failing. It just looks, failure looks different to different people. I think one of the best coaching mentor advices that I ever got was um, to demo things in front of your athletes. And if you don't do it perfectly and you fail and it's bad, then that's good because they can see that you fail. So there is no perfection in that. Um, and I also think um, you all were kind of talking about, um, you know, identifying your emotions and um, something that one of our actually, um, one of our advisors um, did with me, she's a sports psychologist. Um, she gave me an emotions wheel and it went from like, how are you feeling? Sad, happy. Okay, well, what type of sad? Are you feeling despair? Um, and you had to be more specific about this actual type of sadness that you were feeling. And once I, like I was a year out of college dealing with, you know, identity and life after sport. And I was like, what? There's, you can be more than just sad. <laughs> you can be more than just happy there's a type of this. So I think it's so important. And I've had conversations with my athletes. Um, and one of them actually asked me for it to journal, which I thought was awesome. Um, but I think that radical acceptance of emotions and actually identifying what you're feeling and not trying to make it something it's not is so important for, for our athletes. Um, Amanda, do you have something you wanted to add? I was going to say to the emotions thing too, I think it's important to normalize negative emotions too. Um, because I think we are fixers by nature. We want to try and make it positive, but got, kind of going back to that, it's okay to have an off day. It's okay to feel disappointed. It's okay to feel frustrated. And really with emotions, we encourage um, uh, approaching them from a place of curiosity and not judgment. So being curious about where that comes from, not why am I feeling this way perhaps, but what might be causing me to experience this emotion. Let's see what this is about. So I think when we can approach it more from self-compassion and teach it in that way, um, emotions can become less scary because I think sometimes, you know, if we're thinking of failing, it's all the things that come with failing. Um, it's all of those negative emotions we don't want to feel that come with failing that might last longer even after the event is over. I absolutely love all of those points. I think journaling, visualization, labeling your emotions are all things that, and talking about failure um, for sure, are all things that we don't talk about enough. Um, and I think they're, they're things that, like you've all said all night, are things that translate into your sport and also outside of your sport. Um, so 
the last question I have for the three of you is um, if any coaches or professionals after this um, are interested in kind of finding you on socials or finding you, you know, online, wherever, um, where would they be able to find you? So Andrea, I'll start with you. Uh, sure, you can find me on socials. Uh, I have an Instagram. It's uh, at Davis PTSR. So Davis, P is in Paul, T is in Tom, SR. And uh, my email is Andrea at davisptsr.com. Bethany, do you have any contacts? Um, yeah, I mean, you. I have a website, beyondtheoutcome.com. Um, and so you can reach me at um, email. Um, I mean, you can reach me at two emails, I guess. Uh, bbrewster at edgewood.edu. That's obviously my institutional website or my institutional email. Um, and then if you want to reach me outside that, um, Bethany at beyondtheoutcome.com, that will reach me as well. And I don't Amanda. even answer that. I just not into that. <laughs> Amanda, um, do you have any? Yes, absolutely. So um, I am on social as well, um, fit piece by piece. So that is spelled F-I-T-P-E-A-C-E-B-Y-P-E-A-C-E. Uh, and then my website is fitpiecebypiececounseling.com. Well, to the three of you, thank you so much for having this conversation. I think it was really good and it's going to be really impactful. And I'm excited to see what our community has to say about it.